What is your favorite science fiction movie? Is it maybe Robocop, a robot coming from the future to kill human beings? Is it maybe Star Wars and its armies of thousands or millions of robots? Is it maybe Ex Machina, which is the story of a robot that reveals against her creator? Or is it maybe iRobot, which describes a revolution of robots against uh, human beings? No matter what science fiction movie you choose, I bet it will have something to do with artificial intelligence because AI is such an integral part of our future. And no matter what science fiction movie you choose, I bet you it will portray an extremely negative vision of artificial intelligence and what the relationship between machines and humans is going to be in the future. And this negative vision extends to the workplace. A lot of people, for example myself, we are afraid that AI is going to take our jobs away. We are afraid that the workplace is going to become a place where uh, artificial intelligence is making all decisions and where there is no place for uh, empathy or for interpersonal relations. We are afraid that the workplace is going to be a place where everything that matters is productivity. And we know that machines are better than us when it comes to productivity. There are so many things going on in artificial intelligence and in research and development for this, right? We see, for example, self-driving cars. There are algorithms that are able to predict whether we are going to pay our loan back to the bank. There are algorithms that are able to identify our faces. In some cases, AI algorithms are better than human beings. And, uh, well, this negative vision of AI is very widespread. But does it really need to be like that? Is artificial intelligence necessarily going to lead towards net job losses? Is artificial intelligence necessarily going to make the future a less human place? Well, I'm going to analyze in detail what impact artificial intelligence is going to have on jobs and on the future of, of work. So let's start analyzing what is a job and what different kinds of skills do we have in jobs. Everybody knows what a job is. A job is what you do for a living. And within a job, you have to do many tasks. Within a job, you are involved or you are using many skills. Uh, some of these tasks are boring, some of them are interesting, some of them are difficult, some of them are easy. There are mainly three kinds of skills that you put in place when you are working. Repetitive skills, quantitative skills, and what I call functional skills. Let's go one by one. Repetitive skills is everything that has to do with processes. For example, my first job was a dishwasher. I was in charge in, of washing dishes. And there were certainly many kinds of dishes, and each one of them had to be done in a slightly different way, but the process was mainly the same. This is repetitive skills. Other jobs that are very heavy on repetitive skills are, for example, any kind of manual work, any kind of physical work, any kind of paperwork. This is the first kind. The second kind is quantitative skills. Well, quantitative skills is what I did in my, in my second job. When I graduated as an engineer, I became a programmer, and I had to develop algorithms and make numbers, and this was very, very, very quantitative. Other jobs that are heavy on quantitative skills are, for example, scientists, engineers, mathematicians. Huh? And the third kind of skills that we have is functional skills. Functional skills have to do with people relations and with creativity. My current job as a department head is very heavy on functional skills because I have a team. I have to manage conflict. I have to develop the strategy for the team. I have to coordinate my work and the work of my team with other departments, with other functions. And this is why we call it functional skills. All management jobs are very heavy on functional skills. Okay, so all different kinds of jobs are going to have certain combination of these three kinds of skills, but they are typically heavier in one, in one kind of skill. My current job is heavier on functional skills. Maybe your job is heavier on quantitative skills. Now, artificial intelligence has nothing to do with jobs. Artificial intelligence has everything to do with skills. Artificial intelligence is not going to automate our jobs. It's going to automate the skills that are played in different kinds of jobs. And the extent to which a certain kind of skill can be automated by AI heavily depends on the kind of, of skill. For example, 
Repetitive skills are very easy to automate because it's just following a process. Repetitive skills will be heavily automated in the next 10 years. Around 80% of all repetitive tasks will be done by machines, and only 20% will be done by human beings. Then we have quantitative skills. Quantitative skills will be 50-50, because calculations can be done by machines, but sometimes human beings need to use knowledge, or they need to use judgment in order to make these calculations, so it will be 50-50. And finally, we have the functional skills. Functional skills are very difficult to automate because they involve people, because they involve creativity, because they involve ambiguity. As a result, over the next 10 years, human beings will continue doing uh, work that is heavy functional, and machines will be able to do only a small part of that. Maybe 80% will be human, and 20% will be based on machines. So just as a summary, repetitive skills will be heavily automated. Functional skills on the other side are going to be heavily human, and in the middle we have quantitative skills. Now, as you see, some professions are going to grow, and some professions are going to be in decline, and most of the professions are going to dramatically change. Those professions that will grow are those that are heavy on quantitative skills and on functional skills, and those professions that will be in decline are those that are heavy on repetitive skills. So people will have to migrate from those jobs that are repetitive into those jobs that are heavy quantitative. And we will talk later about these job migrations. We will see new jobs. Technology will create a lot of new jobs and a lot of people will move into that. But let's analyze each one of these three kinds of skills one by one. The first one I mentioned was repetitive skills, right? These were the skills that will be done mainly by machines. And these machines, we will call them, and we are already calling them, no-collar workers. These are workers who are robotic, and because they don't have a neck, they don't have a collar. So blue collar, white collar, now no collar. No-collar workers are going to be involved in paperwork, in any kind of department, in finance, in human resources, in, uh, in procurement. They are going to do any kind of physical work. They are going to do any kind of uh, construction work, for example. For example, we are going to have uh, robots that are going to check us out in the supermarket. We are going to have robots that are going to set meetings for us, and they are going to manage our agenda. So what are human beings going to do when it comes to repetitive tasks? Well, they are not going to do the actual work, because the actual work is going to be done by our no-collar colleagues. Humans are going to be focused on supervising the robots, they are going to be focused on troubleshooting the robots, they are going to be focused on making sure that the whole robotic process is running smoothly. For example, if a supermarket uses uh, self-checkout machines, the cashier is no longer going to check out people. The cashier is going to supervise this robot, it's going to make sure that it always works. It's going to make some recommendations to the clients. And it's also going to give conversation to the clients, which is very important when it comes to customer experience. Let's go to the second, kind of, the second kind of skills. The second kind of skills is called quantitative skills. And these skills are very important because they will be automated at 50%. The other 50% is going to be human. And this is very special because if half is done by a robot and the other half is done by a human, there has to be human and robot collaboration. Robots will specialize in those parts of those calculations that will be heavier, that will be maybe higher volume. And humans will specialize in those parts of those calculations that are going to be more complicated, more ambiguous, those parts that require a subject matter expertise or that require judgment. Robots are going to realize when human beings are struggling in their part and they are going to propose to help us. And at the same time, robots are going to be intelligent enough to realize when they themselves are running in trouble and they are going to request human beings for help. One example that I really like about human-machine collaboration is breast cancer identification. Uh, the way you identify cancer, in this case breast cancer, is, well, somebody has to look at medical images, and depending on how the image looks like, you will say this looks like a cancer or this doesn't look like a cancer. Well, according to Harvard research, 
a robot is able to identify breast cancer in medical images with an accuracy of 92%, which is not bad, sounds high. A human being, a human doctor, is able to identify the same cancer with an accuracy of 96%, which is better. But together, together they can do it at 99%. This is why human-machine collaboration is going to be so important. But this human-machine collaboration is going to require changes in our work processes. We'll have to change layouts, for example. If you put robots in a warehouse, you will have to select some areas only for robots, other areas for human beings. You will have to change the layout. You will also have to define the interactions between robots and machines very carefully. There will have to be a governance. That communication will have to be very, very clear. And finally, we have the third category of skills, uh, which is the functional skills. This category is really interesting because it will not be automated, at least over the next 10, 20 years. Artificial intelligence is going to automate the other skills, repetitive skills and quantitative skills. This basically means that AI is going to push human beings towards those skills that cannot be automated, towards the functional skills. This is what happened to me as well. My first job was repetitive. My second job was quantitative. And now my last job or my current job is functional. AI is going to move everyone in this, in this direction. And this is good. This is good because functional skills are intrinsically human. These are things that cannot be done by machines. These are things related to people, to creativity, to ambiguity. And the other reason why this is good is because the importance of these uniquely human skills in the job market is going to increase. Because these are the only things that human beings alone can do. Everything else can be done by artificial intelligence. By freeing employees from having to handle all these other tasks, employees are going to focus on that part of the task that require empathy, that require emotional intelligence, that require communication with other people. Just one example. One example. Uh, chatbots. Customer service chatbots are able to handle, in English, around 80% of the queries, 80% of the calls that you can make to a call center. Employees human uh, customer service agents are going to focus on the other 20% of the queries that machines cannot do. And these queries are the ones that require more empathy, the ones that require a better contextual understanding of the customer, the ones that require a deeper communication with the customer. And something very interesting is that these 20% of queries are the ones that customer service agents particularly like. These are the ones that customer service agents find more rewarding because they involve other human beings. And similarly to customer service agents, all employees do have a preference for that part of their job that involves interaction with other human beings and that involves empathy. And this is really good news because artificial intelligence is pushing us into that. Artificial intelligence is not going to make the workplace less human. And this is a paradox. Artificial intelligence is going to make the workplace more human. And this is great news. This is the great gift of AI to humankind. Because for the first time in history, workers will be able to be human for the first time. We will not need to care about processes or numbers. We will just focus on being human. And as you are seeing, everything that I am saying takes you to the conclusion that we are going to have to upgrade our skills according to this skill set ladder. And we are going to have to change jobs according to this skill set ladder. Well, this is not the first time it happens in, in human history, right? The transition from manual labor into steam took decades. The transition from steam into electricity took decades. The automation of agriculture took over a generation. This basically means that the children of farmers were able to learn at school the skills that will be relevant in the future job market. But artificial intelligence is coming much, much faster than that. Artificial intelligence is happening today, right now. It's not going to be our children who will have to learn the new skills. It's going to be ourselves. And this is not going to be easy for everyone. Just to give you an example, imagine you start your career as an accountant 
10 years later, you discover that accounting is all done by robots, all done by software. And then you say, what do I do now? I have to find another job. You find another job, struggling, really struggling to find another job. And that job, for example, is a drone troubleshooting. The one that is making sure that the drones are flying properly and that is collecting the drones after they finish flying. But 10 years later, that job doesn't exist anymore because another robot can do it. And you have to look for another job. And that job is going to be maybe something related to biotechnology that we don't know yet because that job doesn't exist today. This looks complicated. A lot of people will be able to do that. But a lot of people will not be able to do that. These people will be not only unemployed, but also unemployable because they could not adapt to lifelong learning. And as you can imagine, uh, the advent of the unemployable, the increase of income inequality can, re can result in social tensions, could result in political, political tensions all around the world. So what should we do? What should we do with artificial intelligence? One option will be to say, okay, we're not gonna implement artificial intelligence. We're not gonna do it, we're gonna delay it because there are gonna be trouble. But the other option and the option that I recommend will be, well, just implement artificial intelligence because it comes with a lot of benefits to the global economy through productivity and also a lot of societal benefits as well. But what you really have to make sure is that you facilitate these workforce transitions. You have to make sure that you are helping people to change jobs. And there are four ways of doing this. The first thing that governments, businesses, universities have to do is to invest in human capital. Invest in the skills that are gonna be relevant in the future. And these are the quantitative skills I was talking about before. Mathematics, science, and everything related to AI, programming, data science. And the functional skills such as leadership, emotional intelligence. The second thing we will have to do is we'll have to assure economic growth. When the economy is growing, people find jobs. When the economy is not growing, people don't find jobs. You want people to get new jobs? Make the economy grow. There are different kinds of schools of thoughts about how governments can, can incentivize the economy to grow. One school of thought will be make the government create demand by investing in infrastructure projects, for example. Another school of thought says just quite the contrary, make the government small, make processes, taxes, regulations simple, make the, the market, the, 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 the market uh, for corporations really, really competitive, and then the market will take care of itself and it will grow. Both theories can work in different kinds of situations. The third thing that we have to do will be to make it easy for people to change jobs. Research shows that when more people are changing jobs, more often salaries rise. You want to reduce income inequality, you have to make it easy for people to change jobs. Just make the job market more flexible. And finally, point number four. As I am saying, people will have to change jobs, but not everyone will be able to do it. A lot of people will struggle. You have to create safety nets. Some people are talking about, well, some special social security arrangement, including, for example, universal basic income, which means giving an, a, a salary to everyone independently of whether they work or not. Well, it is not guaranteed that that's gonna work at a large scale, and that is something that might result just in a lot of inflation. But we will have to rethink our safety nets. So if there is something I want you to remember today is, is this, artificial intelligence is going to dramatically change the, the future of work. We are gonna have to upgrade our skills. We are gonna have to change jobs. Not everyone is gonna be able to do that. And we will need to help them. Thank you very much.